What is the difference between a real breakthrough curve and an ideal breakthrough curve? In an ideal breakthrough curve, the concentration increases in the outlet after a certain time from zero directly up to the inlet concentration. This requires a plug flow reactor with no dispersion in the direction of the flow, no mass transfer assistance in transporting the substance from the bulk of the liquid to the surface of the adsorbent, and an instantaneous equilibrium at the surface of the adsorbent. A real breakthrough curve increases less rapidly. In a real column, there is dispersion in the direction of the flow, since different flow channels and different streamlines in these flow channels have different lengths and thus different tortuosities, and there are also different velocities in these flow channels. And because of eddy diffusion, where small volumes behave very much like molecules uh, do, do in diffusion. A real breakthrough curve might also be asymmetrical. If there is significant outer mass transfer resistance due to a substantial stagnant layer outside the particle, the start of the breakthrough curve becomes steeper. This in some of the molecules did not have time enough to interact with the adsorption surface before they were swept through the entire column. If there is significant mass transfer resistance inside the particle, due to molecules needing to diffuse far inside large particles, the breakthrough curve tails, which is that it takes a long time to reach the inlet concentration. Slow adsorption kinetics is another reason for a tailing of the breakthrough curve. So how can we influence the broadening of the concentration gradient and thus uh, the broadening of the breakthrough curve by changing operating conditions? Take a few minutes and try to see if you can figure that out yourself. How does uh, the following in flow, uh, operating conditions influence? So the flow rate, the particle size, the porosity and the pore size of the particles, the molecular size and the concentration influence broadening of the concentration due to dispersion, outer mass transfer resistance, inner mass transfer resistance, and adsorption kinetics. So did you manage? This is rather difficult, but some of the things might be easier than others. So regarding flow rate, you might remember from lectures and books on fluid dynamics that a higher flow rate leads to thinner boundary layers. Thus, an increased flow rate decreases broadening due to outer mass transfer resistance. However, a larger flow rate, since it increases the Reynolds number, increases dispersion. Uh, the flow rate does not influence the inner mass transfer or the kinetics. As for the size of the porous particles, larger por uh, particles means that flow channels in between the particles will be larger, and thus the Reynolds number will be larger and the boundary layer is thinner. Larger por porous particles thus decreases broadening due to outer mass transfer resistance. However, with larger particles, the molecules need to diffuse farther inside the particles. Thus, larger porous particles increases broadening due to inner mass transfer resistance. The porosity and pore size of the porous particles mainly affects the inner mass transfer resistance. The larger the pores and the porosity, the less difficult it is for the molecules to find the free surfaces within the porous particles. Molecular size is perhaps not an operating condition as such, but it is good to be able to extrapolate based on an experiment with small molecules what would happen if larger molecules was to be absorbed. A larger molecule has lower mass diffusivity thus broadening due to both outer and inner mass transfer resistance increases. For the same reason, adsorption kinetics are usually slower for larger molecules. Finally, uh, the clearest effect of concentration is on the adsorption kinetics. High concentration often gives slower adsorption kinetics and thus a longer time is needed to reach equilibrium.